Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, How Verizon Innovates Through AI-Driven DevOps with Dynatrace on AWS. When you joined today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. Also from this control panel, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane. We will collect these and address them during the QA session at the end of today's presentation. If for any reason we could not get to your question, we plan on responding to each of you personally through email. The deck will be available through SlideShare along with the recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation, so keep an eye out for that email. My name is Kevin Cochran, Partner Solutions Architect here at AWS, and I will be your speaker and moderator for today's webinar. I think a great place for us to start this session is to discuss what DevOps means in the AWS cloud. So you can pick any device, any application, and ask yourself, when was the last time it was updated? Not just your phone or your word processor, but what about your Blu-ray player, your TV? What about your little phone app that's your favorite little app or your favorite little game? Chances are those have been updating themselves in the background. You probably didn't even notice it was happening. The DevOps model has been critical in making these kinds of updates successful, and most companies, if not all, are migrating to the DevOps environment. If you look at the bigger picture, DevOps is fundamentally transforming how business is done today. The old way of delivering new features and enhancements and bug fixes all rolled up into a large single package and sent out like oh, every six months or a year or sometimes even longer, that's all obsolete now. And for a number of reasons, I think first and foremost, business is now driven more by software than ever before. Software has made it easier than ever for customers to interact with business, including customer segments we thought would never integrate into the digital age. If we want to remain on the cutting edge, we have to observe how our customers interact with us through our software. Our customers, whether internal or external, expect applications to be stable and they're getting more and more used to features and enhancements added on a continual basis. They're not looking for the next version anymore, wondering when they should upgrade. They just ex expect it to be done for them. And for this to happen, IT resources need to be provisioned quickly and without these formal processes we're used to. Better yet, why not just let your developers provision what they need when they need it? By removing these constraints around developing software, Organizations get back the bandwidth they need to be able to innovate and keep their customers not just using their software, but keeping them excited about using it. By now, I'm sure most organizations have heard of DevOps. If they're not, not already using it in some capacity. But let's cover the basics. DevOps combines the components of software development and software builds uh, with some parts of operations, meaning your dev team has control over whether over when their software is released, where it's put, and they wear the pager. This process not only increases velocity, but it also increases quality. Trust me, your developers don't want to get that 2 a.m. call if they can prevent it, and I think they will prevent it if they're the ones watching the pager. So now, you can monitor the software for defects, performance, trends, which allows for better planning and continuous development. And this cycle continues producing better software at a faster pace. The drive to use DevOps practices comes from some shared interests between product owners and engineering teams. Generally, your product teams want to be more agile with their business decisions and meeting customers' needs more quickly. And your developers would love to have more innovation time. And to achieve this, both of these groups strive for greater stability and security. That's less time dealing with problems and more time working on keeping your customers interested. On the same token, you gain much better use of your time. Less time is spent on dev cycles, releases, failures, and recoveries, and you'll find that your, your operational overhead is lower because you're making better use of your resources. And as you'll find out from Andy and Anil here in a few minutes, companies like Dynatrace and Verizon are able to show some pretty impressive improvements using real data. DevOps isn't just the latest trend. It's really the next phase in the evolution of business and software development. So when you bring AWS into the mix, you're able to easily apply ready-made tools and resources to your application. 
anywhere from defining a complex infrastructure for it or to going beyond development to monitoring and repairing and improving your product. If you're not already familiar with the concept of infrastructure as code, it's, I guess, a simple way to put it, is it's basically a way to ensure your instances are built out the same way every single time. Software like OpsWorks for Shap Automate and EC2 System Manager are available right there in the AWS console. And of course, we have partners like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and others that are actually pretty easy to set up and use in AWS as well. Microservices are a smaller unit of your application which run on their own and serve a single purpose or function. This means your code base is much more manageable and failures can be isolated and rolled back much quicker. And when you combine services like AWS API Gateway and AWS Lambda, you don't even need to manage your own instance. Using these tools together, microservices can be deployed in minutes. Continuous integration and continuous delivery is really the nuts and bolts of a DevOps environment. It's the workflow which takes your code and moves it through build and test and delivers it to its destination. CICD tools like Jenkins give you very customizable workflows called built pipelines. And AWS code services allow you to create cloud native build pipelines using direct integration between AWS resources. And when it's all said and done, you're actually not done. Probably know that already, but in fact, you've only just begun. Now, you'll want to see how your application is being used, how it's performing, and gather metrics to help you build or extend your product's roadmap. Essentially, logging and monitoring give you the insights you need to keep your customers happy. So whether you're just starting a DevOps team or you're a seasoned practitioner, AWS makes DevOps in the cloud pretty simple to work with. Not only do you have the complete visibility to all your resources with the added security, but you only pay for what you use. You can scale, automate, and improve your customer experience without worrying about infrastructure. So I wanna switch gears just a little bit um, away from what I've been talking about and talk about some real cases. So I wanna I want to hear from Andy and later on from Anil about how Dynatrace and Verizon uh, I want to hear about their transformation in DevOps. Andy? Hey, Kevin. Thank you. I hope you can hear me all right. And uh, let's see, actually, if uh, if we're devops enough to actually advance the slides here. Because uh, I think I'm still uh, a little bit behind on uh, on the slides that I was expecting. Here we go. Let's see. Moving forward. Yeah. So um, thanks again for actually giving us the opportunity to speak uh, and talk about DevOps. Uh, Kevin, I agree with most of the stuff that you said. The only thing that I, I think you haven't touched uh, upon uh, enough is actually that DevOps uh, also means a big cultural change, right? Tools are obviously important uh, and it's great that we have uh, companies like AWS that make life easier uh, in terms of uh, automating things, getting access to infrastructure service, getting uh, access to services that we need to deploy stuff faster into the cloud. But I think uh, a big thing is the cultural change. Now, I've been with Dynatrace for more than nine years now. Before that, I worked for a performance uh, testing company also for nine years. So I've been in the performance engineering space for uh, about 18 to 19 years. And I've seen the uh, market shifting a lot. Uh, and what I've seen is that the way we used to do performance engineering in the past, um, it was very static. It was very static because we were having monolithic applications and it was kind of like a fixed set of servers. We'll also hear this from Anil later on. And it was not that it was easy, but it wasn't that hard because you knew what type of dashboards you needed to actually look at your resource con um, utilization of your servers. And then if you had experience, you could actually then correlate kind of manually the log statements with your CPU spikes, with your memory spikes, and then figure out what is actually wrong. But times have changed, right? As we all know, uh, Kevin, you mentioned that we are moving along. We're driven by business. We need to deliver features faster. This is also why the applications that we're building and the services we're building have transformed as well. I mean, you mentioned a couple of those, but if I am starting a new software project now, 
I probably choose different ways for compute, right? Whether it's AWS, whether I build my own uh, cloud using OpenStack, whether I do a multi-cloud environment using AWS and other providers out there, that's one option that I have. I can scale using Kubernetes. I can run on different OSs. Uh, I probably use, and you mentioned some of that, uh, different deployment models to actually deploy code into my environment. I may even use a platform as a service, whether it's a Cloud Foundry and OpenShift. Um, I, I use just different tools now to actually get my apps and services out faster to our customers. Uh, and, and because what DevOps also promotes is actually um, allowing developers to choose the tools and technologies that allow them to succeed faster, I think DevOps actually promotes diversity of technology, which is great because they want to move fast. But what this also means is monitoring as we used to do it in the past doesn't just work anymore because we don't have static environments with a static set of technology. And this is why we at Dynatrace, we went through a major transformation ourselves. And this is why we at Dynatrace also thought about how do we need to redefine monitoring? Because the application infrastructure and the tools that we use and the processes we use and the culture around delivering software has changed. So what we did at Dynatrace is we rethought on what monitoring has to be. Because in the end, monitoring is, as you said earlier, all about understanding the impact that you have to your end users, to your infrastructure. In the end, it's about making your users happy because you want to do business with them. So what we did is we wanted to make sure we capture every user, every app, everywhere, wherever it is. And because it's so complex, because we don't deal with static environments anymore, humans are probably hard, it's hard for humans to actually do everything this manually in this complex environment. We have to use artificial intelligence and thanks to the advances in these technology sets, we can use AI to really get better insights in what's going on. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we as Dynatrace, we went ourselves through a major transformation. We were not a unicorn when we started. Uh, we used to be the traditional enterprise company delivering, Kevin, what you said, two times a year. Uh, but we transformed a lot. We transformed into a cloud native company and in that transformation not only achieve uh, a much faster pace in delivering features to our customers, also moving from on-premise to doing on-premise as well as uh, SaaS based, actually using uh, heavily Amazon services. We transformed our delivery pipeline from six months to one hour from code to production. And in that transformation, we actually learned quite a lot. Not only how we internally need to change our culture to actually make this possible, but also what we need from a tooling perspective and the role of monitoring. Because obviously we are a monitoring company. So what we learned is that when we build our pipelines, obviously we all build pipelines, right? You out there, the listeners are building pipelines. The reason why we build pipelines is because we want to push changes faster from development all the way into ops, hopefully having some quality gates and then acting on the feedback. In the end, what we really want is we want to have happy users and also not keeping track of the costs because if we just push features out without knowing which features are used and how resource intense they are, then we may explode the costs. Now what we saw though is that monitoring traditionally has been only focusing on operations, figuring out is everything good in operations and if there is a problem they do troubleshooting. We realized that monitoring can be used throughout the pipeline, starting with your CI CD pipeline, starting actually on the developer's desk to make them aware of what the code change potentially has as an impact. So using monitoring from dev all the way to ops as additional quality gates when pushing code changes from left to right, but also using monitoring to making better decisions on what to do with a certain feature that we just put out to production. Is it a feature, a new capability that we exposed our customers to that is actually, you know, uh, it received well, then it's great and let's keep promoted. If it's not received well, then let's remove it. If you make a deployment mistake, having a microservice architecture and the microservices that are very chatty with each other are distributed too far from each other, therefore you have network latency, then you can use monitoring to figure these deployment, inf these deployment structures out and optimize your deployment instead of always having to go back to a developers and bug them. So we believe what we learned, monitoring has to be a pipeline feature. And we also hear this later from Anil, because monitoring is more than just keeping your lights on in production. Now, what we also learned is, and as I mentioned earlier, we within our organization, and thanks to customers like Verizon and others, we learned that we have a huge diversity in technology. 
uh, and therefore you have to have a unified version, a unified way of monitoring. Because if you're adding Node.js, you're adding Java, you're adding PHP, you're adding Ruby, you're adding all, all these different technologies, then yes, all these technologies provide individual monitoring tools, but then you will have multiple different monitoring tools that alert you on multiple different things in their technology alone, but they don't give you the full picture. So what I've learned in a recent uh, visit to a conference, alert drowning is a big problem. Drowning in alerts because you get too many. So what that actually caused us to think about is, what does monitoring need to look like? And the, here are some of the key capabilities that we came up with. Full stack with one agent. So there's just one agent that you need to deploy, regardless of the technology, that will monitor your system and then feed this data in your pipeline to an artificial intelligence layer that then tells you what is the real root cause and what are not the, and not the symptoms. Also, we will hear later on from Anil as well, we invested a lot in voice ops, chat ops, and automated APIs because we believe strongly that monitoring has to be part of your pipeline. In order to be part of your pipeline, you have to automate it. And there's new ways now to interact with your system, whether it's through chat ops and voice ops. So these are things uh, we will also hear later how, um, how Verizon has implemented them. Now, last but not least, uh, I think we had some impressive uh, numbers on our transformation. So we invested a lot in the way we deliver software. We invested a lot in quality because, Kevin, you said it correctly. DevOps is mainly driven by business, but this should not mean mark, go to market faster. It actually means quality to market faster because if you don't focus on quality, you just fail more often. So what we did and what we also encourage our customers to do, focus on quality early, use monitoring and lifecycle, and then you can achieve things like what we have here. I mean, you can read the number for yourselves. The number that we are most proud of is the, num the number 93%. In our case, 93% of production bugs actually are found by developers because they're using monitoring as part of the, in, in, in the pipeline, but also in production. And because, as you said earlier, developers are responsible for production. They keep monitoring what's going on once they push a deployment out and then can proactively fix problem before it actually impacts the customer. If you want to hear more about our transformation story, there's a lot of uh, information out there uh, where we explain how we transformed both from a cultural, but also from a technology perspective. But now I want to actually I think hand it over to Anil because we've been working very close with companies uh, like Verizon um, and, and others. And thanks to the feedback that we have received uh, from them and the way we work with them, I think we just came up with, with an even better monitoring solution. So Anil, I, I want to hand it over to you. I can see you're flipping through the slides. I know there's a little lag in there, but uh, enlighten us. I'm just, you I'm, just, I'm just practicing. Thanks Andy <laughs> okay. and Kevin for setting the stage. Uh, this is Anil Chintalapuri. I'm the senior technical manager in Verizon Enterprise Solutions. I'm with the company for almost 20 years and uh, I've seen the entire uh, DevOps, uh, how it's evolved and what business value it adds. And last three, four years has been like really a game changer. So I'm going to talk about it. Um, so what we had, right, the, uh, I just wanted to illustrate the challenges that we had, right? I just want to rewind back to 2013, 13, 14 timeframe, where we were, right? What our application was doing. This is a ProQuest application, which is primarily used in the enterprise um, as a solution space, where we actually do coding and ordering, right? And then it's a very big monolithic application. So we have about 200 plus developers, right? Working in different teams, different directors and all that. We have one big monthly cycle. Right, any requirement that needs to be prioritized and needs to go into that monthly monthly uh, cycle, and we have about you know very fixed capacity. Right, we have about 28 servers. You know, the deployment used to take forever. Right, four hours. Sometimes if you run into issues, it it might even take 12 hours. So we always used to do a release on a weekend. You know, and uh, all the time we used to, used to pay more attention on catching the bugs in the regression cycle, which used to take about three to four days uh, before that we used to do a core freeze, right? So those was the model, that was the model that was there in 2014, right? Pretty hectic and, and uh, I'll give you an example. We used to have business owners asking for BREC and we used to say, oh, for next nine months we're booked. The release is completely booked, right? Reason is we have to have this tightly coupled architecture and we have to tightly manage all these processes, right? With our independent, with our dependent and we need to make sure that we're not breaking anything in the release, right? So it was pretty 
pretty tight. And then the revenue realization was about 18 months. So what it means is if you have an idea, right, right from the ideation to uh, to take it to production, it used to take about 18 months, right? The idea comes in, you know, it has to vet it through, it has to go through the prioritization board, then it has to come through BREC, then BREX will go to the system racks and system racks will then translate into a, a waterfall model release cycle, when it should go, what schedule it should go and all that, right? It used to take a lot of time and by that time our competitors are already beating us, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the story I want to give you. And uh, where we are now, right? What we achieved. We have 3x faster build and test cycles. We have 50% faster de deployment time. Instead of doing every release, now we are doing every two weeks right, which is a great accomplishment. And we have the revenue cycles, right, being accelerated by 33%, right? Now we have, you know, from 18 months, we are now down to like 12 months, and we are actually, you know, doing a lot of improvisation on that. And our target is to get to less than uh, six months or three months. So we, we have, we have a journey, we are on a journey, and we are, we are still trying to do that, right? And the key thing that I want to call out is the issue reduction, right? Test automation actually really helped us, right? Test automation, we spent a lot of time. This actually is a real value add, right? And if you look at the CICD pipeline, test automation is a, a, a plays a pretty big role in how, how much quality of, what quality of code that you're promoting. So this kind of number speaks for itself, right? So let's talk about how we got here, right? I mean, what did we do, right? I think Kevin initially said it's all about culture, right? I think even Andy, you said about culture, right? So you can have a great technology. Imagine if you don't have a culture for change. So what happens? I mean, technology is there. You're not going to use it, right? People are the ones who actually does that, right? So we actually, it's a four-pronged strategy that we have. And the foundation was two things, right? One is, number one is culture. And number two is technology. So we used, dev, uh, we used for First of all, we kind of trained the entire organization into Agile, an Agile methodology. We completely transitioned from waterfall to Agile. So everybody, not just IT, you also have to have the same training from business side. So it was a top-down approach. Our, our business leaders and our technology leaders kind of agreed on the Agile, Agile methodology. We embarked on it, and uh, it was a huge undertaking, and we got through the cultural shift, right? It took us about nine months to do the complete transition, a company like us, right, enterprise-wide, where we have thousands and thousands of people working, right? So in order to get to the agile, it's a major shift for us. Number two is DevOps, right? We put our stake in the ground and said, no code will go in a manual, manual fashion, right? The entire delivery pipeline needs to be automated, right? Every single bit of code should be completely automated and it should go in, in, in an automated fashion to production, right? That's the number two one. Third one is cloud adoption. It's a big one, right? It's a very bold goal, right? We are not there yet. We are still in the transition, right? From monolithic application, we are transforming into a cloud native architecture. We're not completely there yet. And getting onto the cloud is a journey, right? It's not something that I have a big application, let me put it in the cloud, right? Just for saying that I, it can run on the cloud, that's not you, that's not you do, right? That's not how you do it. So you've got to have a strategy on how you're going to take an application and put it in the cloud, which I'm going to talk about it in a, in a little bit. Uh, last, not, last but not least, it's monitoring. Absolutely key, right? You got to know what your application is doing. I think, Andy, you touched upon very brilliant, very good points, right, that you talked about how monitoring is not an after the fact, right? It should be before the fact, right? It's how also, do you I think monitoring? Anil, yeah, Anil, I think uh, I remember we had the discussion at our conference early in February where you actually said monitoring is not only key, but it's also your safety net, because especially if you transition from one uh, mindset to another mindset, from monolith to microservice or from on-premise to cloud, monitoring allows you to figure out, are you moving into the right direction? And is it is are we getting better or not? So it's a safety net Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Actually, I will tell an example, right? When I go, when I show the CICD yeah. chat, slide, I'm going to talk about Hygia, what we did with Hygia and what we did with the uh, Dynatrace and especially the measures that we built part of the uh, test cycle, right, As, uh, the test cycle. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, um, so the next one, uh, why did we choose AWS, right? I can talk about AWS all day long, right? I don't want to bore you guys, but a few things that would stand out right out choice was very clear on why we choose AWS. First of all, it is cost. It is cost effective, right? 
when we do the when we did the comparison between on-prem and AWS, AWS was uh, almost like 50 to 60 percent cheaper. And there is a wide industry adoption, like a lot of industry leaders are using it. So you know the technology is proven. We don't have to do the research because it is pretty stable, and a lot of companies are using it, right? And the speed, right? Um, if you look at in the traditional world, right, in the traditional on-prem world, if you're managing your application on bare metal, you know, provisioning a VM would take anywhere, and especially in Verizon, would take anywhere between you know um, a week to two weeks if you're lucky, right? So I mean, if you have that time frame, right, how quickly can you take an application into production? You cannot, right? So with AWS in a matter of minutes or a click of a button, I will get my services readily available and I can start deploying my application. Availability, global footprint, on-demand services, which I talked about, and the technology diversity that it has, right? So we at Verizon, we use every technology that is available in the market, right, for different needs, right? Not that we we like to explore every technology, but for different business needs, we need different technologies. So that's the driver for us to use the different technologies. And why did we choose Dynatrace, right? Um, we looked at, and going back to 2013 timeframe, right, um, we partnered with, uh, you know, different companies, right, to come up with the strategy for, um, uh, application monitoring, right? And we usually we use a product from Ericsson, which is called <clears throat> Order Care, and that's the proprietary platform. When we looked into the AW, uh, when we looked into the monitoring space, there are like three, four products that stood out. And the reason why we picked Dynatrace was it has immense capabilities in monitoring. The first and primary uh, thing was you know our class instrument, your class instrumentation that has to be done on the application because it was a proprietary application, a bunch of things that were getting done, and we have no clue inside. The inside details were not visible, right? So, but Dynatrace is the first product to go out there back in those days, right? Now you have a lot of class instrumentation from different products available, but back then, you know, class instrumentation was uh, pretty unique, and Dynatrace was the first one in the market to provide that. Um, the another thing that I said was the transition, right? Um, that we are going through. You need to, you should be able to manage your application on bare metal. You should be able to manage your application on uh, private cloud. You should be able to manage your application on public cloud, right? These were our three key requirements for us in order to select the right um, APM software. And Dynatrace luckily had all the technologies that it can support, right? And we have a private cloud or sitting on a PCF, right, uh, powered by VMware, right? VMware is the hypervisor below, and then we have a PCF running. And Dynatrace implementation was like a breeze, right? We just had to install a, a service pack and be done with it, you know, just bound to a uh, bound to a service, and then you, you're pretty much, um, you know, you get all the monitoring uh, insights into your Dynatrace server. So that was the one, that was the first part. Second part is capturing 100% user experience. Absolutely, it's a need. It's a complete need, right? It is a necessity, right? I would not consider this an after fact, right? Because when you're deploying an application, right, and your application goes into production, you should really know how your application is performing, right? I should be able to replay every single transaction that the user did, right? We support a global sales uh, workforce, right? They are in EMEA, they're in APAC, they're in LATNAM, they're in US, right? Multiple regions we have users, right? They're logging from different different locations, different countries, different speeds, and they have Citrix, they have a bunch of these things, right? And if a user complains, my one of my key foundational requirement is, I need to know what happened to the user, right? Not only just what happened to the user in the application, but I also need to know what is causing it? That's more more important for me, right? There is some system cause that is actually contributing to the, to the uh, latency of the user, right? That's very important. Uh, the next one is the DevOps integration. Like I said, DevOps integration is absolutely a need for us. You know, both shift left and shift right. Um, you know, see what's happening in testing and what's happening in production. And the last one, which is really close to my heart, is the artificial intelligence and predictive uh, predictive analytics and remediation, right? <laughs> I have a complete slide about it. I'm going to talk about it. This is a, a real need, right? Um, four years ago, three years ago, when we didn't have this solution, right, 
there were so many alerts, so much noise that gets generated. I mean, even if you're running this in a bare metal and you have you know certain certain set of softwares and alerting mechanisms in place, believe me, there are so many metrics providers that will give you all this data, but there's no way for us to actually tightly integrate all these events and correlate it together and come up with a root cause. It is not easy, right? It's all manual process, right? So I'm going to talk Anil, about it. In, yeah. yeah, Anil, so one, one quick thing here, because this is also obviously dear to both of our heart, and it just reflects what I hear out there as well. You guys are moving from enterprise software on-premise and including now cloud native technology and it means if you have multiple different monitoring products for different technologies and different environments you will just end up even with more alerts because these tools only see they are part of the picture and that's why okay. ai is is so key right and uh yep. where would you do and, and in cloud yeah i'm going to talk about it a little bit because one of the you know throughout our transition right cloud transition we actually you know take, took one of the component and moved to cloud and guess what, right? We have now 90 plus services running. And uh, imagine that you need to monitor all those 90 plus servers and imagine the noise it generates, right? Yeah. With cloud, with yeah. microservices architecture, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, like like we talked about, this is the cloud uh, container technology. I know Andy, you want to talk a little bit more about it, right? Um, yeah. So, so basically what we what we did, and again, thanks for all the feedback that you guys at Verizon and other companies gave us, and also in our own transformation. We, we heavily invested in making sure that we have out-of-the-box support for the latest and greatest technology. So for instance, for Docker, um, you install Dynatrace on the Docker host, we automatically instrument the containers. You should not worry about which type of monitoring tool to inject into which type of application process in which container or in which image. We just do this all automatically for you. Also, we understand the cloud providers natively. So we pull in metrics, as you can see here from the screenshots, uh, from EC2, from CloudWatch, and add our own additional data that comes from our agents that run on your virtual hosts or as you said, PCF, if you run on Cloud Foundry, if you run on OpenShift, this is all automatically there. And uh, I think another big piece that we did, and Anil, you mentioned this, is the 100% um, end user visibility, right? It's automatically when you install Dynatrace, we give you full visibility into your end users, understanding where do they come from, which browsers do they use, how do they navigate through your system. And I believe, Anil, one of the things you said uh, earlier is this, and now you call it end user replay. This is kind of seeing every single click along the way of, of a user and the application that you guys transformed, your ProQuest, this is a heavy money generation application. That means every user is, is gold for you, correct? Exactly, exactly. And each user, right? Imagine that they'll be working on like, you know, big cores for the enterprise customers, right? Not about the volume, right, at this time, right? It's about the function that's available on the timely manner, right? If I can generate a code and give it to a customer, right, I might lose, you know, multi-million dollar business, right? That's mm -hmm. the impact, right? And yeah. and this one is a very heavily, I will admit, uh, Andy, this is a very heavily used feature in Dynatrace, right? A lot of our developers, right? A lot of our first level support, right? They use this. They use this. Right. The moment they they see some escalation from a user, right. First thing that they go they do is go to Dynatrace, right. Uh, and we tag every user by their email. They search search by the email, and then do do a quick drill down on what happened, right. You can quickly go to the hotspots and see what is happening for this, right. And if there is a issue, right. The best part is you know the peep path you can completely export and send it to a developer saying that hey look. By the way, I'm sending you this PPAP, please go look at it, your code, right? And then developer looks at it and say, oh, guess what? I have a problem. Let me go fix it. And they will they will put a fix. They immediately know we create a Jira ticket. We immediately put a fix, and that will be scheduled for the next deployment. Mm -hmm. So very Beautiful. heavily used. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, this is the DevOps delivery pipeline that we have implemented in uh, Verizon. Uh, obviously, you can see a bunch of tools, you know, starting with Atlassian, right, Stash, Jira, and we use, uh, we actually, you know, in test automation, we initially use Selenium, um, and then, you know, Selenium back then, you know, it is completely a little bit complicated, right? We didn't have all the features and everything, and we ran into this object identification issue and things like that. Then we shifted to UFT uh, from HP. It worked pretty good, 
but the problem with the UFT is it cannot be running in multi-threaded mode, uh, and we need a lot of big infrastructure, right? That's uh, into to run your to, to run our test cases, right? If we have to run our test cases in less than four hours, we probably need like you know 50, 60 VMs for that, right? So we are actually evaluating some of the uh, tools that are available in the market with Selenium, and we want to go back to Selenium. But that's the lesson learned, right? So we, we have to do what we have to do at a given time, right, to have the CI CD pipeline completely uh, automated. Uh, the other thing that I want to call out is the um, high tier dashboard that kind of gives you a complete uh, uh, DevOps delivery pipeline. And one thing we integrated, which we are proud, is the instrumentation, code instrumentation testing. So what we did was we picked up uh, the top 10 user actions, top 10 uh, you know, milestones, top 10 APIs. And what we did is we wrote measures in Dynatrace for those uh, things. And we integrated that with Hygia, right? So what it does, build over build, right? When a build happens and the test automation kicks in, the, the functional testing, when it kicks in, it kind of you know, measures those key APIs, key clicks and everything and kind of you know, builds a baseline. So in Hygia dashboard, if my management looks at it saying that how, how are we doing build over build, they go to this Hygia dashboard, they can pretty much see a trend, right? Top 10 clicks, how is it trending? Is it trending up, trending down, right? Top 10 APIs, how is it going? Trending up, trending down, right? And if we see anything trending up, we, we know exactly that this particular build has created a problem, right? And then we can go back to Dynatrace and see, hey, for this build, for this test user, I can have a test users, right? We already have like bunch of test users that we set up in the system. We can go search for the test user for that time frame and see exactly what has happened to this API for this user and do a drill down and quickly identify the problem. So that's the beauty of um, the Hygia dashboard and the DevOps integration with, uh, with Dynatrace. You have any comment, uh, Andy, on this? Well, the only, I mean, I mean, obviously, this is a topic that I've been promoting for many years, so I, I, I love it, right? Shifting left, finding things early on, uh, stopping bad code changes as early as possible, even on the developer's machine. So now we also promote Dynatrace on the dev workstation. So Dynatrace uh, Appmon, there's a personal license that every developer can get for free because every bug, every bad code change that can be prevented before it actually makes it to your Git repository is, is the best thing ever, right? So that's why shifting left and also shifting right and, and defining these metrics. And a big shout out just to uh, Topopal and the guys from Capital One who built Hygieia. I think that's a fantastic thing that they contributed to the open source community, also showing that even organizations, banks like Capital One can uh, make a cultural shift and actually open up and uh, contribute things back to the open source community. I think that's that's just great. Yep. All right. Um, again, right, this is the artificial intelligence. So I'm going to give you some story here, right, and in, in, uh, I want to rewind back again to 2014, right, which is our favorite uh, topic to discuss, right, artificial intelligence, right. We used to get so many alerts, right. We used to get alerts from Dynatrace. We used to get alerts from infra monitoring that we have with BMC Petrol, Nagios, right, DB alerts, log alerts, right. Name it, right? We have even built some custom alerts, right? And think about you're in the production support uh, shoes, right? What do you do? You get these many alerts, right? And the relevance of alerts will lose slowly because if you get thousands of alerts on a daily basis, right, you kind of miss out on the important alerts, right? Which happened even in Verizon, right? We get alerts, then we ignore, right? Because there's so much noise. There's like 900, 500, you know, thousand emails per day, right? And how do you keep track, despite of putting so many filters in the inbox and folders and all night, all that stuff, you still miss out on the important alert, right? And guess what happens, right? You miss out on the important alert and you will have the, the infra alert that will take the precedence where you will have the heap about 90%, right? Or CPU running hard. That's when you get onto CMD and it is too late, right? By the time you, your heap is 90% uh, utilized, or or your CP is running hot, and those sorts of things are happening, I mean, it's too late. Then you get there, and then you try to debug what's happening, and you lose another four hours, right? Four to five hours. If you're lucky, you know, you can get it out in within an hour. But if you're not lucky, you can spend the whole day in figuring out what's happening, right? So we said, we said uh, let's take a step back, right? And we said, what do we do here, right? How do we make our operations much better? And we came up with this, um, 
you know, pretty, um, I wouldn't call a, a pretty latest and greatest architecture, but we came up with a pretty simple model, right, with uh, ML and AI. And we kind of, what we did was we took out all these, you know, data collectors, we wrote some adapters, and all these adapters would feed into a database, right, where the policy engine runs, right, kind of groups, kinds of has the thresholds, it exactly know what those thresholds are. Obviously, you have to set those thresholds, right, it'll run. And then those things will be given to the correlation engine, right? Correlation engine will then feed it to machine learning al algorithms, and it also has the historical data, right? And also has the grouping logic. But the biggest problem that we ran into in this is we need to train the system, right? I mean, it, it's good. You can just give a bunch of alerts into a bunch of uh, events into the MLAI a module, but MLAI, what does it do, right? It will just give you whatever the correlation is based on the algorithm that you're using, it gives you that. But you need to train the system, right? What event is tied to what, right? Let's say, for example, you got a, a, a alert on heap size, right, which is 60% utilized, right, which is out of your threshold, right? So behind the scenes, you might have a stuck thread. Right, you might have a stuck thread, and then that stuck thread might be doing a, a long-running SQL, right? That is act, that's actually doing a big I/O operation on it, which is kind of completely tied up, and you know it's choking your your database, right? So those are the key relevant information that you need to give it to the system to train it, and then you know then the correlation engine will give you some sort of a recommendation saying that, by the way, here is the root cause. So it took some time for us to do it. And it is working, it was working pretty efficiently, right, 80 or 90% of the time. We know exactly the root cause. We don't have to, I mean, there's still some scenarios where you have to go do the manual triaging, but majority of the times, you know, if you go log into the tool, it really tells you where the problem is and how to solve it. And we did some little orchestration on how to auto-correct it. You know, some were very simple shell scripts and some were Python scripts that you can go quickly, do certain operations automatically. You don't have to wait. Um, uh, wait until you know a user comes in and does that operation. So that's our solution um, that we implemented back in 2014 to a 15 time frame to reduce the noise and uh, you know do the streamline processing for our production support folks. Mm -hmm. Andy, any yeah. comments here? Yeah, I mean basically what you guys did, right? You guys, you guys were kind of spearheading the whole thing and, and basically try to figure out how could artificial intelligence work in your own environment. Now what Dynatrace did, we basically learned from our own transformation into the cloud, but also getting the feedback from you. And what we then did, we first of all, we expanded the Dynatrace capabilities to not only do APM, we also do log analytics now. So we understand, we detect log messages when they're written, uh, when critical log messages are written, they feed into our AI. We do infrastructure monitoring, database monitoring. We look at GMXS and you see all the different data sources that we now cover. Everything comes out of Dynatrace. And then just as you did with your rule engine, your machine learning, we have our artificial intelligence that then makes sense of the data and then only alerts you in case there is really a problem telling you what the problem is and the potential impact. So now how does this work? By the way, integrations, as you can see here with some of the products, uh, there are also other integrations, but I just highlighted some of those that are relevant for the production use case. Now, the, um, the thing we do is instead of alerting on individual outliers, we alert on anomalies. So we baseline every single metric that we see, whether it's response time, failure rate, throughput, network connectivities, uh, disk, all the stuff that you mentioned. We baseline, and because we also have the model underneath, meaning who is talking with whom, which service, which, which other service, which machine with which other machine, we are able to then, in case there is an anomaly, tell you, what is the potential impact? Because we also see the end user. So what you can see here is we actually tell you there is a problem and it impacts, like in this case, 254 people. Now, this is good information for you because you can know, do I need to run if 254 people are impacted? But if it's 254 out of 10 million, it might be less of an impact than if you normally have 300 people and 250 are impacted. So giving you the business impact that defines your priority. But then because we have all the underlying data, we can tell you exactly what the root cause is and not the, all the other symptoms and all the other events that, that were kind of piling up to that event. Also, a big thing uh, is we see that more and more people need to interact with monitoring data because monitoring allows you to make better decisions. So while we build dashboards, I think that are visually very appealing and very easy to use, we also understand 
understand that people are moving towards chat ops. We have integrations with Slack, with HipChat, and with other popular Slack uh, chat uh, options. So you can actually talk with the monitoring solution and add ask questions and then there's an artificial bot that actually gives you answers but we also implemented voice ops so for instance the first integration we did was actually with Alexa so you can actually talk with the monitoring system and say how is my conversion rate doing on the latest marketing campaign or I'm exposing people to A and B I'm doing A B testing is A better than B so these are all things that you can ask the systems because you want to make it easy to access for everyone that needs to make decisions based on monitoring data. And Anil, you mentioned that you guys also implemented that because we do have the information about who is impacted, what is the root cause, what was leading up to this event, so which deployments were made, which log statements did we see, what did scale, how did we scale up depending on load. We have all this information and therefore we can actually make it easy for you to trigger remediating actions. So whatever you know, automation tool or configuration management or orchestration tool you have, we can feed data into your system to potentially get to auto remediation, even auto healing. So I think this is what is possible uh, with uh, the Dynatrace data and which we've implemented based on our own learning when we transformed from on-premise monolith to microservices in the cloud, but also combining these two worlds. Don't We must not forget that most companies out there that make the transformation to the cloud and to DevOps still have to deal with a lot of these enterprise applications because we have to talk to them. So this is very important that Dynatrace also covers the full technology breadth and also is fully automated into your pipeline. Now, so uh, one comment, one comment, right, on the auto remediation that I want to give some advice to the developers out there who are listening, right? Mm -hmm. I think you know running writing code in cloud is pretty easy because it's all loosely coupled I can do it and I can push it right so mm -hmm. what if my code has a bug right I have a you know n plus one problem or something right that my code has I, I didn't anticipate it it went it and I didn't catch it in any of the testing scenarios right it went right so mm -hmm. it is absolutely a need right auto remediation is a need it's a must-have because you know the moment this code bug goes in and you're in an auto scale mode, right? And let's say, you know, auto scale can be like, you know, if you're configured it to 100 instances, you quickly run on the cost. The whole point of going to cloud is to, you know, get resources on demand when needed, right? For the right reason, not for the wrong reasons, right? If you have a code with a bug, that's the wrong reason. And you can quickly eat up these thousand instances or hundred instances just like that, right? Mm -hmm. So auto remediation is a must the moment you see that there is a problem and this is where the Dynatrace can help, right? It's a, it's a must have strategy and you can see it and then you can flip back to your previous version of the code, right? Or mm -hmm. whatever, you know, whatever remediation, remediation step that you have built, exactly. Yeah. Right? So, so Anil, I think uh, we're getting close on time here. We should probably wrap. I know we could talk forever, but uh, people also want to have some, some Q&A with us. I guess your final advice before we go into Q&A? Yeah, I, I already said it a few times, I, I will reiterate again, right? Monitoring is mandatory, right? This has to be fully automated, right? It should not be an afterthought. It should be completely, you know, blended into your CI, CD pipeline. Everything full should be automated. You got to have complete visibility, right? Uh, the, um, the other thing that I want to talk is, you know, moving out of, you know, traditional ops model to no ops model, right? If you look at cloud, right, the automation that brings in, right, everything can be done through a click of a button. With Jenkins job, you can do it, right? For example, we see that in, in Pivotal Cloud Foundry and in AWS, right, uh, where our test environment is. Um, with a click of a button, I can create everything, right, from scratch. I can build an environment. I can bring up my application. I can push configuration, everything, right? So. It, it is, if you look at it from a uh, from an operations perspective, you know, the three-tier uh, support model that you had, you have where you have dev, test, and production support, all these are, all these roles are getting combined into one, right? So you as a developer have a vested interest in understanding what your application is doing in production, right? You can just, you know, I, I checked in my code and be done with it, right? I left for the job. That's not that's not the uh, strategy, right? If you're a developer going forward, if you're embarking on this cloud, you got to really know what your code is doing, right? That's mm -hmm. my piece of advice. So I agree with you. Great. Um, is that, I think that's about uh, all that you and um, Andy have. Is that 
Is that about right? That's, that's like correct. Right. Yeah, I think Great. we want to go to Q and A because yeah. I can. I'm Absolutely, sure we we'll definitely appreciate that. And I just wanted to remind everyone that any questions that we can't get to, I know we ran a little over time, but any questions we can't get to, we will definitely um, answer via email. So let's go ahead and transition to to Q and A and. Um, uh, I'll just turn it over to Andy and Anil for some of the questions that are coming their way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. Thanks for passing these questions along. So I'll, I'll try to start from the top. Uh, the first question is: How can Dynatrace reduce the noise and point to the root cause analysis? I believe I showed some of that in the slides at the end. So what we do, and please feel free to actually see this yourselves by uh, just signing up for the free trial that you have here. So we have Dynatrace available as a SAS trial, but you can also run us on premise if you want to, depending on what um, you feel more comfortable with. But the way we work, you install an agent on a host and we automatically detect all the processes, the log messages that are written. We in automatically instrument your Java.NET, PHP, Node.js uh, processes, and then we baseline. So in order to reduce the noise, we actually learn and baseline every single metric. And because we also underneath the hood have the full dependency model that we automatically create based on the information we can capture through our agent. So we know all the individual network connections between processes and services. We know which applications, web or mobile applications are using this service. So we have the full model, which we call SmartScape. So because we have that model, because we have the baselining and we detect anomalies and because we have you know, many years of experience knowing which metrics normally correlate how, we actually were feeding all this information into our AI, into our machine learning, and therefore are very confident that we can reduce the noise and therefore also point to the root cause and not just give you uh, a lot of different uh, e events. Um, I hope this answers at least, uh, at least this question. Um, also, Kind of going to the next one, uh, I think uh, this was asked, it's, it's called while replaying, uh, can we find out the corresponding log in the console as well? I believe this is when we talked about the end-to-end -end user tracing and the having every single user available. The answer is yes. So Dynatrace not only captures what's happening on the infrastructure, not only in the application, but also on the logging. So we automatically see every single log file that is written, and then we can actually show you which log messages have been written by that particular transaction. So this is also uh, also all there. Um, so I, I see I see a list of questions. Uh, Anil, do you want to pick uh, one of them? I don't want to be the only one that is talking here. <laughs> okay, so I will uh, pick on one of them, right? There's a bunch of questions, right? I'm just uh, going through it and, and my, sorry, I apologize. I'm not picking the questions in uh, the right order, right? So do you think it's a possibility to have too much data um, log, right? How do you deal with data coming in from different levels of your system to the different environments? Great question, right? If you're trying to ship the log, which is like terabytes of data or you know gigs of data, right? You obviously will have a delay. So what we implemented is we implemented streams, right? Streams is nothing but you will have a live log, and it's much more efficient to parse the log, get the log, and do it on a near real time basis. So streams makes your you know whichever log file, even if you can stream a, a, a half a gig uh, log file to it, it can handle it. So that's how we were able to manage, you know, log data. And uh, the way we put it in is once it is stream and once the rules are done on the stream, we dump it onto the HBase database. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you want to pick another one? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I hope I understand this next question correctly. But uh, does Dynatrace operate over an AWS direct connect connection or does it require an internet connection? So two things, we allow you to run Dynatrace either as a service where we host it primarily in AWS, right? And then if you run your system in AWS, it will basically be just sending data to Dynatrace that also runs in AWS. But we also give you the ability to run Dynatrace in your own environment. This is what we then call Dynatrace Managed. So, and then you're obviously completely free to do whatever you want because we understand certain companies uh, have 
you know, cannot move to the public cloud, therefore they have their own private cloud or whatever it is. So you can choose both deployment models, which also works pretty well if you are in a transition phase, right? If you are like uh, Anil, what you did, right? You transition from your on-premise data center and now slowly moving projects into the cloud, but these new cloud projects still talk with your enterprise apps that are running on the data center and therefore you need monitoring that actually works in both worlds. And maybe in that case, because of regulations, you choose to have monitoring actually on-premise, to monitor on-premise and the cloud. So we give you, uh, we give you this full flexibility there. Yep. Hopefully this answers the uh, question. I have one more question that I want to take, right? <clears throat> so, um, uh, hi, I'm a PDM build manager at FCA, question to Verizon. On your presentation, you indicated that AWS helped you to save build and test size cycle time. How is that possible? I can understand that AWS can help on release and support size and then reduce the build errors. So basically, I want to know how, what functionality aspects AWS can help me on build testing and reduce the bugs on the code, right? So, this is a big question, right? I'm not saying completely AWS help, right? Your key is DevOps pipeline, right? I think I, I spoke about that slide pretty in detail, right? Especially the test automation, right? The effort that you need to put in test automation and the complete automating your pipeline, right? Without automating the pipeline, I cannot be, you know, uh, sending code at a rapid fashion, right? You cannot do continuous delivery, right? That's the key. AWS, what it does, if you need resources on demand, right? To the, towards the continuous integrated delivery, right? If you really need a, a new EC2 instance or you have to provision a, or you have to really kick off a Lambda function or you have to do something on AWS, right? All I need to do uh, is, you know, write a cloud formation template and then, you know, give it to the orchestrator, right? AWS does that, right? So I'm no longer, so it's a, it's a two-pronged strategy, right? One, you need to really have a complete automated delivery pipeline, right? Without that, you're not going to get any benefit, right? Then to complement that, you need to use the AWS services wherever you are using your AWS services, right? You're shifting from one zone to another zone, one region to another region that you're shifting, then that would really help. Or you're creating a new EC2 instances, or you're creating a new EBS, right? You're doing a file mount, whatever you're doing, right? That's part of the AWS uh, uh, cloud formation template. So the two-pronged strategy. Hope I answered your question. Thanks, uh, Neil I, and Andy as well. Um, yeah, it looks like we have time for just one more question. So, um, Andy, if you want to take the next one. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of questions around uh, how our anomaly detection works, how the baselining works, how the machine learning works, and also one question around licensing. So I just want to answer quickly. I think I, I, I explained a little bit in the slides also how we do baselining we do baseline different metrics with different uh, with different approaches because you know the response time is differently to be uh, baselined uh, than for instance network connectivity and network quality if you want to learn more about our anomaly detection about our baselining about uh, our AI then please do me a favor go to Dynatrace search for artificial intelligence or search for baseline and then you will find information also use cases but the best is actually try it yourself you can see the bitly link here bitly slash dtss trial and the last thing on licensing uh, you can also get all this information on the website but basically uh, for our SaaS based monitoring we license uh, per host, so whatever uh, host you have, there's obviously different licenses depending on the size of the host. So if you think about a microservice environment where you have very small individual components, then uh, we obviously apply uh, uh, different um, different licensing uh, depending on the size. But this is basically just standard what you would uh, see with other cloud vendors. It's similar to what uh, Amazon is pricing or other cloud vendors are pricing. But also there's more information online and be happy to follow up with anything else in case we didn't answer everything. There's other questions too, but yeah, I'm running out of time. That's great, Andy. Yeah, I, that's um, these are great questions and great answers, and um, I think it's uh, I think it's great to see how not just our customers like Verizon who are making the transformation, but also how even our DevOps partners and people who are thick into the space actually made the transformation themselves. It's um, it's encouraging and like you said, Andy, it is a culture change and the, the tools support that. So mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and we, we just wanted to say thanks to Anil and Andy for joining us today, and uh, that's going to wrap up our webinar for today. As a reminder, you will receive an email within two to three days with the links to the slides on SlideShare, as well as the recording of today's webinar. And we want to thank you all very much for attending. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much.